that we have received an overwhelming response from all over the India, which includes students, faculty members, and researchers from various universities and colleges. And we are really thankful to all of them. Now I request our respected principal, Professor Moshumi Singh Shengupto, to say a few words to inaugurate the session. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Andrila, for your uh, uh, introduction. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure uh, for me to welcome you all, all the participants, basically, to the online lecture series, which is organized by the Department of English of our college. Uh, now, on behalf of uh, the, our uh, college uh, managing committee and governing body, I extend my cordial welcome to all the speakers of this online lecture series, namely uh, Dr. Chandrani Biswas. Uh, she is uh, an associate professor of English in St. Xavier's College of Animal, Kolkata. Our uh, speaker, Dr. Mohua Bhumik, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English of Dirozio Memorial College. Dr. Shuchandana Vartacharya, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. And Dr. Chandrava Chakravarti, Professor and Head, Department of English, West Bengal State University. Now, I am very happy to come to know that uh, the number of participants in this uh, online lecture series uh, exceeds, uh, exceeds 700, means almost it, uh, 750. Uh, and uh, it is really, uh, I mean, the, it's a, uh, we must greet to this uh, online platform basically for that because we can reach out to so many participants on, uh, I mean, the, uh, for, uh, for them basically. Uh, so it, uh, in this case, what I think the geographical distance basically doesn't matter. So we must greet the online platform once again. Now, uh, during this lockdown period, we are really all, uh, they, we are all of us are under severe crisis. And of course, the student, the youth, basically, they cannot go to college, they cannot uh, spend time with their friends, and so on. Uh, so I think it's a very good initiative of Department of English of our college that they are arranging uh, it's a nice, a nice lecture. I mean, the lecture session, basically a series of lectures for our students. And so not only for students, their participation is also uh, appreciated from the faculty members, research scholars from in and um, in in uh, West Bengal and all over the country. So I am very thankful to the organizers. To, uh, the convener of this program, all uh, uh, I mean the faculty members of the department, Swara, Dipayan, and of course uh, the uh, the members who are basically uh, giving the uh, technical support to this program. Also the participants. So without wasting for time, I'm uh, I uh, I'm handing over this microphone to the organizers and thank you once again madam for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, i mean the uh, to speak for all of us today thank you thank you very much thank you so much ma'am for your kind words it's a great opportunity that we have with us dr chandrani bishash as the speaker for today's session Dr. Bishash is an associate professor in the Department of English of St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, and has served as head of the department in English from 2009 to 2013. Her research interests include women's writings in the African and African-American traditions, black feminism, modern fiction, and 19th century Bengali literature. She had presented papers at innumerable seminars and conferences and has several articles to her credit in journals and anthologies of repute. Professor Bishash has delivered lectures on diverse subjects 
as on Austen's fictional narratives, Victorian women's literature, post-colonial literatures, African and African-American women's writings. She has delivered lectures as a resource person at various conferences organized by Institute of Advanced Research, Shimla, International Conference on Postcolonial Literature, Department of English, University of Calcutta, conference organized by Society for Victorian Studies, American Study Circle, American Center, lecture to Australian students in educational exchange program, conversation with author Ruskin Bond, panelist and moderator at seminar on celebrating 200 years of Emily Bronte, at Diamond Harbor Women's University, delivered talks on the future of English studies in Doordarshan Bangla and several other academic platforms. Her book, Woman and War, was published by Books Plus, New Delhi. Among her many publications are Rethinking English, Literature or Culture Studies, The English Department of the Future in Narrating the Trans Nation, the Dialectics of Culture and Identity, Kolkata, The Uncharted Territory, a Comparative Study of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye and Bucci M. Cheetah's The Slave Girl in Anxieties, Influences and After, Critical Responses to Post-Colonialism and Neo-Colonialism, Worldview Publication, New Delhi, Travelers and Survivors, The Saga of the New Women in Bucci M. Cheetah's Second Class Citizen and Gwendolyn in New Literatures in English, edited by Ketoki Dotto, published by the Book World, Kolkata. Her recent publications include Regarding the Other, The Politics of Race and Gender in Alice Walker's The Color Purple, Critical Perspectives, edited by Devlina Das, published by Pencroft International, New Delhi. Article entitled Desire and Dharma, a study of the representation of fallen women in the novels of Wong Kim Chandro, anthologized in Unveiling Desire, Fallen Women in Literature, Culture and Films of the East, edited by Devli Nadas and Colette Moro, forward by Nawal El Saravi, published by Rutgers University Press, New Brunswick, Camden, an article entitled Reworking the Gothic in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights in an enigma called Emily. Reassessing Emily Bronte after 200 years, edited by Windrila Ghosh, the Department of English, Diamond Harbor Women's University, published by Avenal Press, Kolkata. Ralph Ellison, the invisible man in the American novel, From Hawthorne to Heller. Cultural Contexts and Critical Perspectives, edited by Ashok Mohapatra, Pritha Chakraborty, and Shorbani Banerjee Mukherjee, published by Macmillan Education, Delhi. Dr. Bishash has also been a guest lecturer in the Department of English, Center for Language, Literature and Culture Studies, School of Languages of Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and in the Department of English of University of Calcutta, Currently, Professor Bishash is a visiting faculty in the Department of English of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. In today's session, Dr. Chandrani Bishash will be delivering a lecture on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The title of her lecture is The Journey Within Post Colonial Responses to Heart of Darkness. Before moving on, to the main lecture, I would like to request all the participants to switch off the video and audio. Please do not click the present button to share your screen. To avoid the distractions, please pin the screen of the main speaker. After the main lecture, with permission of the honorable speaker, we will conduct an interactive session. The interactive session will be moderated by Professor Swara Thakur and Professor Dipayon Dotto. So I request all the participants to write their queries, their questions in Google Meet chat box and YouTube live chat as well. Now, without much ado, I would like to hand over 
this session to our honorable speaker professor chandrani vishash over to you ma'am good evening everyone am i audible am i audible yes ma'am good evening Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be a part of the academic uh, proceedings the online lecture series organized by the department of english thk jain college i take this opportunity to thank the principal dr moshini singh sen gupta the head of the department of english professor uindila sen gupta and members of the organizing committee to plan the online lecture series in times of such uncertainty and crisis So it's, it is indeed a daunting task. One of the organizing team members, Professor Swara Thakur, happens to be a former student of the Department of English, Saint Xavier's College, Autonomous. She was a committed, intelligent, and perceptive student, whom we are very proud of. Thank you, thank you, Swara. Thank and you, thank, you. thank you for your kind words. And uh, it is That's indeed my time. privilege. <laughs> It is indeed my privilege to share my reflections today with my esteemed academicians, uh, with uh, fellow speakers on different days, uh, students, and literature lovers. Uh, so, uh, we begin. May I begin with my paper? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes. ma uh, my paper is titled "The Journey Within: Postcolonial Responses to Conrad's The Heart of Darkness." Joseph Conrad. Uh, a name which is associated with enigma inscrutability intrigue ambiguity one of the most paradoxical figures in modernist fiction his art at its most represents the condition of paradox polish nobleman and british citizen master marina and a committed author moralist and skeptic aptly he describes himself as homo duple there's a little disturbance coming uh, in the sound i request everyone once again except ma'am uh, please everyone please put put your microphones on mute miss mrs oparajita guho uh, we request you to mute your microphone thank you uh so we he actually described himself as homo duple which means the double man uh conrad was a bundle of contradictions one of the reasons is obviously because he was a polish uh by nation by nationality but uh, due to the disturbances in poland because of the uh, political aggression of russia as an imperialist power he had to migrate he migrated to england Uh, much against his wishes so in his works we all always witness a kind of a contradiction of sorts uh, psychological contradictions moral paradox a lot of uh, conflicts of the soul so to speak in his works therefore we wade through the maze of contradictions linguistic virtuosity but the sense of inadequacy of language a commitment to solidarity and an abiding preoccupation with isolation which was his favorite theme romantic enthusiasm and cynical irony of the political leader hostility to revolutionaries get on in the no yeah i continue these are part of the online thing so there's nothing to worry about it it's coming so he had a lot of cynical ironies hostility to revolutionaries but at the same time sympathy for rebels his works have been termed as yani form as they seem to have been presided over by the classical god the two-faced classical god janus who looks in opposite directions at the same time like many other poles conrad was an anglophile regarding britain as a land which reconciled tradition stability and respect for individual liberties in the victorian age british administrators officers explorers and travelers often wielded a distinct prestige as did the image of the english gentleman 
reticent, honorable, firm, and keen on fair, fair play. It is an image which masked, of course, the extremely unfair reality of colonialism. In his unforgettably intriguing narratives, F. Conrad, we find the partly observant, partly critical, and philosophical reflections of characters uh, such as Charles Marlowe, Charles Gold, Captain Riley, the anonymous captain in the secret sharer, Lord Jim, and many, many others. While crossing the oceans, he was a seaman. He was basically a mariner to start with. And later on, he learned English at an adult life. He mastered English. And he wrote so well that he competed with contemporary writers like, uh, you know, Joyce and others and won the appreciation of people like Henry James and T.S. Eliot. And uh, he has been compared also to writers across the continent in, the, in, in, uh, in, in Europe. He has been compared to people like Thomas Mann and uh, Kafka, Camus and the existentialists. So while crossing the oceans, he accumulated an abundance of experience to supply his later novels. So his experiences at the sea was a staple diet of his the themes of his novels, exotic landscapes, seascapes, storm and calm, tropical shores, diversity of characters, known or merely glimpsed. Seamanship provided an ethical code which depended not on metaphysical postulates, but on the practicalities of survival. Now, he saw the sea storms, he managed uh, ship mutinies, he managed uh, tempestuous situations. He had did a lot of mechanical work as the captain of the ship. So, so he was very he, he was very reality bound. But at the same time, the contradiction is, in spite of being so reality bound, he was such a philosophical writer. He recognized the ship as a political micro microcosm, a floating community. But he also experienced the littleness of a humanity encompassed by the immensity of the sea and the sky. In Conrad's narratives, the protagonist's encounters with indigenous people. Now, we all know that Conrad uh, had made many sea voyages, and many of his voyages were in the Malayan archipelago, Southeast Asia. And he interacted with innumerable indigenous people, native people. And uh, there was, in his mind, therefore, many questions about their cultures, about their language, and many other kinds of religious affiliations. And uh, therefore, there we, we see a conflict between uh, the European assumptions with the native uh, realities. And he asked questions like, what, are, what is the basis of civilization? What is the real meaning of progress? Were there any essential differences between the Europeans and those they sought to colonize? Now, Stein, a beautifully philosophical character in Lord Jim, has observed, and I quote, what he says, and this can this pertains also to colonization. I quote, man is amazing, but he's not a masterpiece. Perhaps the artist was a little mad, artist referring to God. Sometimes it seems to me that man is come where he's not wanted, where there is no place for him. For if not, why should he want all the place? Why should he run here and there, making great noise about himself? talking about the stars, disturbing the blade of grass, unquote. In his last essays, Conrad bluntly termed imperialism in Africa, and I quote, as the vilest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the history of human conscience, unquote. Conrad's major phase as a writer extends from 1897 to 1911, a period of astonishing vigor and vitality. Uh, in which he produced, among other texts, The Nigger of the Narcissus, Youth, Heart of Darkness, Lord Jim, Typhoon, Nostromo, The Secret Agent, The Secret Sharer, Under Western Eyes. Conrad's narratives are immensely rich in texture and implication. Thematically, the novels hold a remarkable range of reference to problems of politics and psychology, morality and religion, social order and evolution. Conrad's innovative views of now, Conrad uh, uh, used a lot of uh, uh, innovative modernist narrative techniques, such as the flashback technique, the non-linear method of narration, the forward-backward narrative movement, uh, delayed decoding, a cha you know, and all these kind of things sort of challenged the use of the doppelganger motive. All these elements 
challenged and interrogated conventional modes of reading and interpretation. Conrad intriguingly engaged himself with the theme of commitment and betrayal. This was one of his favorite themes of sin and betrayal, treachery, which was perhaps based on a guilt-ridden conscience on his decision of having to leave his motherland in a state of political turmoil, as he mentions in one of his letters of how he was haunted by the act of a standing jump. This is the exact phrase that he uses, a standing jump that he had to take from his immediate milieu, his homeland and his responsibilities." Unquote. Conrad interestingly problematizes the complex relationship between the real self and the idealized self. It is uh, again one of his favorite themes. The idyllic self of a man like Jim provides him imaginary safety. Jim's moral sense, I'm talking about Lord Jim, is clearly outraged by his actions. This outrage racks his high conception of himself that compels him to see himself actually as he is outside his reveries. Yet a romantic aspirer must plunge in the destructive element. As Stein suggests to Jim, he says, in the destructive element, immerse. In his notes on life and letters, Conrad noted that, I quote, our best hopes are irrealizable. It is the almost incredible misfortune of mankind, but also its highest privilege to aspire towards the impossible, unquote. Now, Heart of Darkness, the novel that we are talking about today, was first social, uh, serialized in Black Books magazine from February to April 1899, and The Living Age from 18th June to 4th August 1900. It was first published in the form of a book in 1902 together with uh, Youth and the End of the Te Tether. Now, Heart of Darkness is a rich, vivid, layered, paradoxical, problematic novella, a mixture of oblique autobiography, traveler's yarn, adventure story, psychological odyssey, political satire and skeptical meditation. The narrative uh, draws on the kind of materials that have been earlier used by writers like Ryder Haggard, Rudyard Kipling and R.L. Stevenson. It is a story of the journey into darkest Africa, a region given publicity not only uh, by the explorations of H.M. Stanley, but also by the Berlin Conference of 1885, which had recognized the existence of the Congo Free State as the personal possession of King Leopold II of Belgium. It was an era of intense international rivalry for colonial possessions. There was widespread interest in the political, moral and psychological challenges afforded to European, Europeans by uh, African colonization. The tale that is a uh, heart of darkness, deals with the atavism and decadence at a time when these topics had been given a lot of importance by people like Emil Zola and the group of naturalists, by Cesare Lombroso, who was a criminologist, and Max Norden, who was the author of Degeneration. Norden, for instance, uh, claimed that civilization was being corrupted by people who were morally degenerate. The charismatic yet depraved genius may have influenced Conrad's depiction of the famous Mr. Kurtz. In Heart of Darkness, a story is told by a British gentleman to other British gentlemen. The convention of a tale uh, within a tale, which is a Conrad favorite technique, was a reflection of the social customs of the age, of gent gentlemen's clubs and semi-formal gatherings where travelers would meet to compare notes and exchange yarns about foreign experiences. It also emphasized the interplay of personal and social experience, perhaps dramatizing relativism of perception, limitations of knowledge, or conflicts between private and public codes. The novel makes an inquiry into the nature of colonialism and makes a severe denunciation at certain points of it, which also illustrates Conrad's own ambivalent attitude towards imperialism. It questions the value of white civilization and the desirability of its transplantation to what were then considered as primitive countries. One of the merits of the novel is, a, is the depiction of colonialism, not only as a political and economic venture, 
but as a consequence of the individual's lust for power and even as an epitome of man's capacity for evil. Early in the narrative, the, the narrator uh, makes a record, and you know, he, he records his, or remembers, recollects the glorious adventures of the past where he says, and I quote, I was thinking of very old times when the Romans first came here 1900 years ago. The other day, light came out of this river since, land in a swamp, marched through the woods, and in some inland post field the savagery, the utter savagery had closed round him, all that mysterious life of the wilderness that stirs in the forest, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. He has to live in the midst of the incomprehensible, which is also detestable. Unquote. Now, note the use of the words incomprehensible, which is detestable. Now, what, what is detestable to us at times? Sometimes things which are not known to us are a source of inscrutability. Something which we don't know, a culture which we are not very well acquainted with, a country which we are not very well acquainted with, that is particularly the reason why Africa was being labeled as a dark continent. It's a land of savages, the savannah grasslands and of, uh, of, of, of savage people, barbaric people, uncivilized people, because this is based on the essentialist Eurocentric assumption of not knowing that Africa is a very rich land consisting of many countries, many cultures, many languages, many ethnic groups, many, many different religious, diverse religious groups. And therefore, Africa was considered to be a source of uh, anxiety and yet a great source of uh, economic empowerment for the colonizers. So because the Europeans did not know what Africa was. It was a dark continent and they had innumerable irrational assumptions about Africa, its culture, its geography, its uh, history, etc. Conrad's attitude to the colonial enterprise remains unarguably ambivalent. Again, I say it's ambivalent because he speaks for, he speaks against very often. And that makes it very interesting as he observes, and I quote, they were conquerors. And for that, you want only brute for force, nothing to boast of. When you have brute force, since your strength is just an accident arising from the weakness of others, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing." Unquote. Conrad presents an angry, do angry document in the form of Heart of Darkness. An absurd and brutal exploitation of people. Marlowe is treated to the spectacle of a French man of war shelling in an unseen enemy village in uh, Africa, in the bush, and presently he wanders into the grove at the first company station where he sees starving and sick Negroes withdrawing to die. Although Marlowe's mission is limited to the rescue of Kurtz, there is a sense in which his trip to Congo is itself a recreation of the colonialist expedition. His definition of colonialism is ambivalent again, since he asserts it is redeemed by the idea of work. The colonial expedition strikes him as uh, a merry dance of death and trade. What he justifies as work is an irrational and meaningless violation of the land and its people the transplantation of the trappings of white civilization and of a behavior specific to it makes no sense here. No effort is made by the colonialists to understand the alien population that they exploit as raw matter. Yes, this is exactly the word which is used, raw matter. In fact, I would like to refer to Martin Balmer, who in his very well-known study on racism talks about, and I quote, the linking together of the four ideas, black, other, sinner, dangerous, runs throughout all the manifestations of medieval Christian thought. The Saracen, the enemy in the epic poems, the bird that distracts the saints at prayer, are black. Bernard Rotta has also shown that many writers, sometimes drawing on astrological theories, depicted terrifying demons with Negroid traits and described gigantic Africans as black as Satan. Unquote. We also have, uh, I mean, all of us know about the infamous transatlantic slave trade where we had shiploads of African slaves being 
bought from the west coast of Africa and bought, brought to fill up uh, the southern plantations in North America at, at, in the Atlantic seaboard, family after family, without any kind of kindness or sensitivity to their rights, was sold off and segregated and separated. We find such beautiful slave narratives where writers have talked about their experiences. Black writers like Frederick Douglass or W. E. B. Du Bois. Marlowe's descriptions are uh, a unique blending of his ambiguous responses to the natives. While he is conscious of their strangeness and idiosyncrasies of their culture, he is horrified to come upon natives who are too tired or too ill to work and merely left to die. They are described by white men as, these are the words which I use, shapes, bundles of acute angles, phantom figures. Black men are dehumanized and objectified, trapped by massacre and pestilence. The prevalence of death among men is a ravage in the ravaged forest gives Marlowe the impression that he has entered some gloomy inferno. As Marlowe's insistence on blackness, disease and death indicates it is not light but darkness that the white man has brought with him. Throughout the text, Marlowe, Conrad's transtextual narrator, insists upon the distinction between truth and lies, between civilization and savagery, the self and the other. The lure and fear of the other initiates the pursuit, initiates the pursuit and discovery of colonialism. The conviction of the inferiority of the other justifies the undertaking. In psychological terms, the other is but the undiscovered territory in the self. In the colonial enterprise, this territory of the unconscious is displaced onto another people whom both allure and terrify. The colonizer, fearing to succumb to the other, attempts to contain it through subordination, suppression, or conversion. These strategies of containment are designed to pre preserve the opposition and inequality between self and the other that justifies the imperialist enterprise. The central trope of imperialism is what Abdul Iyan Muhammad terms, and I quote, a Manichaean allegory that converts racial difference into moral and even metaphysical difference. This allegory characterizes the relationship between dominant and subordinate cultures as one of ineradicable opposition. Colonialist literature, as byproduct of the imperialist enterprise, necessarily reinscribes the Manichaean allegory either to confirm or to interrogate it and in an effort to move beyond its limits. As a result, colonialist texts take two forms which, with two responses, the Im imaginary and the symbolic. In the Im imaginary colonialist text, the native functions as an image of the imperialist self in such a manner that it reveals the latter's self-alienation. This self-alienation consists in the failure to recognize as inherent within the self-despised attributes the imperialist's projects onto the other. Thus, the imaginary colonialist text adheres to a fixed opposition between the self and the native, insisting upon the homogeneous identity of the indigenous population and taking refuge in the superior, more enlightened, and more uh, civilized perspective of the dominant culture. In a dialectic encounter between self and the other, the dominant culture brackets its own values in order to resolve cultural oppositions through syncretic solutions. The entirety of Heart of Darkness attempts to deal with the other in symbolic terms. At various points in the narrative, the ambiguity of understanding is highlighted as Marlowe states that his experience was, and I quote, not very clear, and uh, yet it seemed to throw a kind of light, unquote. Throughout the text, Marlowe works hard to separate savage customs from civilized behavior. He distinguishes the comprehensible language of civilized discourse and the incomprehensible language of savages, which is uh, represented in the role of drums, abrupt burst of yells, savage clamor, savage discords, tumultuous and mournful uproar. All voices, European and native, degenerate in Marlowe's memory into one immense jabber. Silly, atrocious, sordid, savage, or simply mean without any kind of sense. On the other hand, Marlowe's compassion extends even to the cannibal crew of the Roa de Belge. Deprived of the rotten hippo meat, they don't get any food for days together, these workers. 
and they have got some rotten hippo meat they have brought along for food and paid three nine inch pieces of brass wire a week and they subsist on and this is how Marlowe describes lumps of some stuff like half cooked dough of a dirty lavender color. Conrad was reaching through Marlowe to the humanitarian pretenses of some of the looters precisely as the novelist today reacts to the moralisms of old Cold War propaganda. The expedition is a personal ordeal for Marlowe. He witnesses the ordeal of black slaves chained to each other with an iron collar on the necks, carrying baskets of earth from one place to another. Marlowe's very concrete rendering of his journey also evokes an expedition into the psyche. When Marlowe steps out into the gloomy circle of some inferno at the outer station, the disturbing shadows he comes are exploited men. But the image evoked is also of those who suffer in hell, as usually represented in Christian iconography. The first Negroes Marlowe sees on the edge of the continent are full of vitality. But as he goes inland, he meets first men reduced to slavery, then mere shadows left to die like animals. The darkness of the inferno at the outer station is the reality of the whites have brought with them, and the light of civilization subsists only in appearances, such as the light attire of the accountant and his devotion to apparent order in maintaining fines. Marlowe's matter-of-fact tone adds to the irony which prevails in his narrative and arises from the discrepancy between apparent commonplaceness of some of his statements and the reality that they convey. The manager, for instance, inspires uneasiness, not because of his superiority, but because Marlowe discovers there was nothing within him. There are a lot of white men working over there before meeting Kurds, he meets them. Marlowe suspects that if he poked his forefinger through this white man, he would find nothing inside but a little loose dirt, maybe. So here you see that Marlowe is critical also of other white men. The other white men aimlessly engage themselves in their concern for ivory, and Marlowe calls them faithless and bewitched pilgrims. The manager in Marlowe's uh, choice of nightmares, you know, is full of cynicism and self did uh, which is contrasted with uh, Kurtz's self-deceptive idealism. Unlike Mr. Kurtz, this manager is a commonplace man with no genius, no learning, no intelligence, but always assuming that he knows a lot. He can only keep the routine going, but originates in nothing. His ineptitude is an ironic comment on the civilizers, the white civilizers claim to intellectual and technological superiority. The manager's agents walk with long staves in their hands, aimlessly about in the sunshine, as they revere the ivory which they find in Africa, like an idol, as if praying to it. They serve, in fact, not anybody, but the flabby, pretending, weak-eyed devil of a rapacious and pitiless folly, which presides over the colonialist enterprise. They walk in the sunshine like Eliot's hollow men, we all remember those lines, isn't it? As I quote, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dry voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless, as wind in dry grass, shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion, unquote. Marlowe depicts the horrors of the dead land, the cactus land, as Eliot would have called it. The behavior is a parody of the purposefulness that ought to inspire what white man saw as a mission to civilize Africa. These sordid buccaneers are reckless without hardihood, greedy without audacity, and cruel without courage. Conrad's use of the term El Dorado and buccaneers clearly links these men with the New World conquerors who were hoping to find an El Dorado in South America, like Sir Walter Raleigh and with the expeditioners in several European nations who were merely thieves of Central America's riches. Conrad's sense of ambiguity and ironic approach to colonial exploitation was probably influenced by real life experiences since childhood. Conrad's parents who were dedicated patriots were exiled by Russian authorities for subversive and conspiratorial patriotism, partly as a result of his, of his parents' political struggle against Russian oppression, both of whom died when he was a boy, he developed a keen sense of the price in human terms exacted by political idealism. 
the astutely skeptical advice of his uncle, Tadeusz Grabowski, as contrasted to the romantic idealism of his father, Conrad developed a sense of paradox and ethical conflict aptly reflected in his depiction of Mr. Kurtz. Norman Sherry has pointed out that, the, that a man called George Antoine Klein was a real-life counterpart to Mr. Kurtz. It seems at times in the narrative that Namalo nurtures a secret admiration for Mr. Kurtz. As he describes him, for the first time that he meets Mr. Kurtz, he says, he describes him as, I shook hands with this miracle. I shook hands with this miracle. And I learned he was the company's chief accountant. I respected the fellow. I respected his collars, his vast cuffs, his brushed hair, his starched collars and got up shirt fronts were achievements of character. Unquote. Marlowe's description of Kurtz is contrasted with an immediately following description of strings of dusty niggers, black men, with dusty feet and blank eyes. The accountant of the outer station calls Mr. Kurtz a very remarkable person. He is said to belong to the gang of virtue. And before he meets him, Marlowe admires Mr. Kurtz, humanitarianism and romantic idealism. So he is also curious to find how Mr. Kurtz's moral ideas will stand the test of experience. Kurtz's idealism and desire to bring the light of white civilization to Africa are inseparable from his inordinate pride and willpower. This applies to him both as an individual and as an agent of Europe. His many gifts as a musician, painter, journalist and politician make him truly representative of a highly sophisticated culture but also of the Eurocentric belief in its own universal superiority. His arch egoism is reflected in his words. He says, my intended, my ivory, my station, my river. He's reminiscent of Conrad's observation in a letter that, and I quote, a man haunted by a fixed idea is insane. He is dangerous even if that idea is the idea of justice, unquote. Marlowe is appalled to discover a little later, later on, he, these are his discoveries, to discover human heads on the fence surrounding Kurtz's outstation. To hear that he took part in unspeakable rites and that he was prepared to kill the Harlequin, a man who had saved his life for a little ivory. Marlowe attributes the transformation of virtue into vice in Kurtz due to his lack of restraint and adds, I quote, there was something wanting in him, some small matter which, when the pressing need arose, could not be found under his magnificent eloquence. Unquote. Kurtz's love of words is not matched by a moral sense which could save him in moments of crisis. It has become a mere facade hiding a hollowness which is different from the manager's. Hence the contradiction between the expression of, well, he says, every altruistic sentiment. He talks about altruistic sentiments, Kurtz. And then he says also, exterminate all the brutes. Now, these are contradictory statements because it illustrates the unavoidable ambivalence of the imperialist attitude. Heart of Darkness combines a Victorian ethic also and late Victorian fear of the white man's deterioration with a distinctly Catholic psychology. We are protected from ourselves by society with its laws, and watchful neighbors, as Marlowe observes, and we are protected by our work. But when the external restraints of society and work are removed, we must meet the challenge and temptation of savage reversion with our own inborn strength. Just principles won't do. This inborn strength includes restraint that Kurds lacked, but the cannibal crew of the Roi de Belge surprisingly possessed. He is a hollow man. And later on, Malu says, perhaps there was nothing within him. Perhaps the chief contradiction of the novel is, the is that it suggests and dramatizes evil as an active energy. The novel is apparently an account of one, one man's moral and psychological degeneration, which is, of course, Mr. Kurtz's degeneration, and another's, which is Malu's intellectual journey to understand the essentials of the matter. Kurtz had been given the responsibility with the making of the report from the International Society for the Suppression of Savage Customs. Marlowe had read it. 
He began his treatise, I mean, Kurtz began his treatise on the stereotyped Eurocentric essentialist assumption, as he writes, and I quote, we must necessarily appear to them, that is the savages, in the nature of supernatural beings. He approached them with the might of a deity. Unquote. Initially, Marlowe is overwhelmed by the motion, notion of exotic immensity ruled by august benevolence, the unbounded power of words, of burning noble words, the power to charm. And this is, I mean, very, very beautiful way of speaking, eloquence. The problem of Kurtz is eloquent and unscrupulous moral facility. And Kurtz himself, his essential self, bothers Marlowe more than anything else. But Marlowe is unarguably disappointed with the man without substance. Even after his death, Marlowe observes, the voice was gone. What else was there? The separation between Kurtz's speech and his unvoiced self is often seen in relation to his degeneration. In comparison to civilization within, with its externally imposed restraints of law, society, of various kinds of rules, we find, and public opinion also, there was a world of dangerous possibility to Kurtz, and he must depend on his power of devotion to reach that standard. Kurtz's false faith is not a faith in oneself. As a moral being, but as a being who could use or discard morality, Kurtz lived as if what was essential about him were wholly separate from what he professed to believe. Kurtz's degradation is not the traditional result of a moral failure. It is the effect of setting himself apart from the earth and morality of the earth. Kurtz's crime or achievement is not that he has managed things badly for the company, but that by means of an act of vision he has severed himself from the possibility of good. Kurtz's famous deathbed cry, we remember that? The horror, the horror, refers to the approach of death. It can be that he is uh, suddenly aware of, uh, of, of death. And therefore, his sense of fear is reflected in his words. His experience of savage life or a mark of weary grayness. The cry is also an exclaimed cry of a discovery of the real darkness that lies within. It's a response to the most private nightmare, to the unknown itself. In Under Western Eyes, a character called Sophia Antonova makes a distinction between those who burn and those who rot and remarks that it is sometimes preferable to burn than to rot. The Kurtz who had converted himself to one of the devils of the land, who had in solitude kicked himself loose of the earth, burns, while the others rot. Malo does not view Kurtz's last utterance only as a cry of selfish despair, but declares that Kurtz had summed up everything. The morality and meaning with which man surrounds himself and his experience is unreal. The reality of experience lies beyond language and the processes of the human inspiration. As Marlowe comments, and I quote, he had made that last stride. He had stepped over the edge while I had been permitted to draw my hesitating foot. Kurtz, in a way, releases his id from the restraints of his European ego when he allows his forgotten and brutal instincts to revive and stir the memory of monstrous passions. Marlowe sees Kurtz as a Faustian figure whose unlawful soul has been beguiled beyond the bounds of permitted aspirations. Kurtz has entered a realm of experience which is beyond the conventional scope of good and evil. And this is something that Marlowe, a mere tourist in the dark side of the mind, can barely understand. In the descriptions of the indigenous population, even Marlowe attempts to deny the power of the other he fears by resorting to stereotypes. Marlowe's compelling but ambivalent description of the savage woman is intriguing. The savage woman is actually Kurtz's mistress. She's a black woman. The savage woman, according to Marlowe's description, is a distillation of alluring but frightening otherness. A dangerous allure is partly responsible, according to Marlowe, for Kurtz's going native by insisting on her in ineradicable twofold otherness, the savage and female, as distinguished from civilized and male. She's wild, gorgeous, proud, wearing a helmet, armor, and magic charms. She's fearless in the face of the pilgrim's bullets. And she's implacable with an inscrutable intention. A threatening otherness, overt sexuality, and aggressiveness claims upon Kurtz's person. 
voracious and diabolical. She appears to belong to a matriarchal and polyandrous female warrior culture. Equated with her wilderness, she is kind of uh, the reason that has made Kurtz her concubine and thereby drained him of his vitality. The image of Kurtz in a male heart directly threatens the patriarchal and ostensibly monogamous structure of the society from which he has emigrated. The last dimension of otherness that I talk about, with which I finish, surfaces frighteningly in the cannibalism that Marlowe impulse, uh, you know, shows in the native workers aboard his boat, who at any moment may devour Marlowe and the pilgrims. Cannibalism. In the novel, cannibalism serves as a metaphor of the absolute violation of boundaries between one human being and another, the physical equivalent of the cultural absorption by the other that colonizes spheres. On another level, the cannibalism that Malu imputes to the natives may be also a guilty projection of the rapacity of the white colonizers who, as Jonathan Swift had noted about earlier British exploiters in his modest proposal, have already devoured the native population in less literal ways. Since the European intruders have invaded territorial boundaries, have violated property rights, have in fact confiscated the natives' most personal property, their bodies, the Europeans are but one step from literally devouring the inhabitants. They are also cannibals, in a way. Marlowe describes the insatiable Kurds as threatening. As he gives one of the very disturbing descriptions, I quote, I saw him open his mouth wide. It it gave him a weirdly voracious aspect, as though he had wanted to swallow all the air, all the earth, and all the men before him." Unquote. Similarly, the African natives exist in their text as expressions of Kurtz's and Marlowe's intentions. They exist for Kurtz's uses and are confined to Marlowe's conceptions of them. Thus, the horror is indeed the name of the intention of the colonizers. It designates the violence that results from the intentions of the powerful who impose their will upon the powerless. Out of darkness is then an account of a journey into the center of things, into Africa, of Kurtz, Marlowe, of human existence itself. At the end of the search, we encounter a darkness. And it is no more defined than at the beginning of the journey. And the narrative it continues to exist only as something inscrutable. In a personal record, Conrad observes, and I quote, in that interior world where his thought and his emotions go seeking for the experience of imagined adventures, there are no policemen, no law, no pressure of circumstance or dread of opinion to keep him within bounds. Who then is going to say nay to his temptations, if not his conscience? Unquote. I close my lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. It was really an insightful lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your engaging and nuanced talk. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, we a great opportunity that uh, we are getting uh, to hear to you and we'll definitely look forward for more opportunities in future to listen to you thank you so very uh, much ma'am uh, now ma'am if you permit then we'll start the interactive session yeah, sure sure uh, definitely uh, now oh. i request uh, mrs swara thakur and uh, professor dipan dotto initiate the interactive stage. All right, okay. Um, I have a question here by someone, Naeem Ansari. He's asking, was Kurtz ever in love with the natives? Now, this is again a question related to the ambiguity of Conrad's representation of Kurtz. Because finally, we should, we should uh, understand that it is the author who has created Kurtz and his views are coming in and these, his views have always been paradoxical. Now, Kurtz represents initially the figure of a European missionary who comes to spread light in the darkness of Africa and to do them good. But ultimately, as it turns out in course of the journey that Malu himself undertakes and he comes to understand Kurtz, Kurtz 
is driven by a Faustian lust for power. Though, of course, he is in love with a black woman whom I just described as, uh, as Marlowe perceived as the other. So uh, it is a dual feeling that he had come initially with something, but then he was in search of ivory, he was in search of making money, he was working for his company, which was the European company, and therefore he was a representative of European imperialism. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Now we have a question by yeah, Professor yeah. Modutanda Ray Choudhury. Yes. Um, yes Could you please talk a little bit about the representation of the other in the late Victorian adventure stories, like perhaps King Solomon's Mines and Conrad's representation of the other? Could you talk about the racial politics of those adventure stories and Conrad's works? Now, the thing is. Uh, in the uh, late Victorian uh, adventure stories, now Victorian age was an age of imperialism. It was an age of expansion. It was an age when you know everything they were uh, England was searching for more and more colonies, and so a large number of writers were devoting themselves and they're creating and an creative energies also to the writing of stories and the writing of fiction associated with the representation of the natives. But in the case of, of uh, the Victorian short story writers, I find that. It is rather straight uh, in the sense that they are represented in terms of binary oppositions. The whites associated with uh, qualities of enlightenment, of uh, civilization, of, uh, of culture, and the blacks, on the other hand, with inferiority, etc., etc., etc. But it is not so straight at all in Conrad. Chinua Achebe, the very famous uh, African writer, had said that Conrad is a bloody racist. And he has given uh, us reasons also why he has he calls by Conrad a bloody racist that he has portrayed Afri Africa and Africans in a lot in large sections of the uh, novel in very very negative terms. I've shown it also in, in course of my lectures. But at the at, at the same time, there are very many places where he is portraying himself as a bitter critic of the imperialist mission, where he is identifying and sympathizing with the natives where he looks not down upon them, but treats them as human beings. So there is an, uh, 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 you know, Marlowe has an ambivalence in his attitude when he looks at the strangeness of certain customs, like the way in which they dress, the way in which they talk, the way in which they shout or the, their uproar, the, the beating of the drums, which are strange customs to him. But at the same time, he does not in any case, in many cases, does not support the manner in which they are brutally, uh, you know, dehumanized by the white people. So this is the looking upon the other. The other is a source of threat, but at the same time, there is a sympathy for the other, at least in Conrad. Yes. Yes, Matisha. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, there is another question which is related to this. So it was simply this. How would you respond to Chinua Achebe's allegation against Conrad for the latter's portrayal of the natives? So you've already answered I this. I have already answered this. Question. Yes. Um, ma'am, uh, one of our students is asking that, ma'am, can you please repeat one of your quotes from the text, starting with best hopes are irreplaceable, that quotation. I have to find that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, I will. I will. One of, uh, yes, the, it begins with, the line begins with. Best hopes are irreplaceable. Hmm. That's what he has written here. Yeah, it's a very beautiful, you have some beautiful quotes. I think Conrad, in spite of uh, mastering the language much later, sometimes writes better than some of the English writers. I like his style of writing very much. Beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Mm. can't find it right now. Right now, maybe a little later, yes? Yes, ma'am, that's fine. That's fine. I'll just ask the next question then. Um, one, Joita Dhali has written, how far does the character Marlowe, how far is it justified in the light of the author's own experience? That's the question. Now, uh, Marlowe, as you know, is uh, Conrad's transtextual narrator. That is, he figures in many of Conrad's text. He travels from text to text. So he was in youth, he was there in lodging, he's there in Heart of Darkness. Uh, he is chosen by Conrad precisely because to a certain extent, you know, Conrad and 
de Malo share the doppelganger motive. You know, yeah. they are uh, yeah. one with the other. He shares his responses. And Conrad himself does not want to mediate his views directly to the audience, does not want to impose himself on the audience. So he mixes up the narrative with a complex uh, narrative focus by giving his narrator uh, you know, all the reins of control. And there are lots of similarities. In fact, Conrad made the, had in his childhood a dream of going to the Congo Basin. And we find that here also, Malo also travels to Africa. So Malo's voyage to Africa is actually Conrad traveling with Malo. And Malo's experiences, Malo's responses, Malo's psychical fears and anxieties and his happiness. Right. Yes. Shares a lot with Malo. Yes. And I love that last line of, sorry, that last line of uh, the last description of Malo sitting like in a Buddha-like posture. At the end of Art of Darkness, sadder and wiser. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Nisha Rakwal is asking, ma'am, what is your opinion about today's globalization as a form of hidden colonization? Well, uh, this is more a question related to social sciences, but uh, yes, uh, uh, we are talking about colon uh, colonization, we're talking about uh, imperialism uh, for those countries which were colonized by England and they were erstwhile colonies of England after, after getting independence there was another different kind of colonialism which got uh, which which arose in those countries that was neo-colonialism that is mm. these men left the white men left after problematic negotiations but the, they, they, they had kept back a group of trained people, uh, political leaders and even otherwise, a group of people who were empowered with the ideologies of the white colonizers and in a way they started colonizing their own people. Okay, so uh, the concept of new coloni colonialism in the broader context of globalization and in terms of globalization, of course, without uh, coloni colonization being prominently present in a, uh, in, a, in a very visible form, we can see colonization in very many other forms in terms of economic transactions. In terms of, you remember Jimmy Porter uh, saying in Look Back in Anger that in the 20th century we will all be Americans. Yes. The culture, the cultural conditioning. Uh, which uh, Ngugi Iwatiango, the Kenyan writer, says that before we do anything, we need to decolonize our minds. He has a very famous book called Decolonizing the Mind. Right? Thank you. <laughs> there are many, many questions, uh, but we will only take up a few now from YouTube. I have asked some questions from Jimmy. So, Deepayan, you can ask questions from YouTube. Yes. Thank you, Swara. Uh, yeah. The first question I got uh, from YouTube is already answered, and I think, ma'am, this is a question that gets repeatedly asked. It's about a white Hindu Achebe called uh, uh, Conrad a bloody racist, and I do have a question somewhere related to this, which I'll ask later, ma'am. Uh, and I should go move on to the next question asked by Mr. Amit Sarkar. Uh, he asks, in, wa in what post-colonial perspectives Shakespeare's character Caliban from Tempest is similar with Conrad's character Curse? But ma'am, I think he means Prospero. Like, uh, it's if not Caliban, go, Prospero. Yeah, if, if um, I, can, uh, I would say that in spite of our brilliant post-colonial readings of uh, The Tempest, I do not see much of a connection between the two. Uh, they are very generalized responses. So. Um, Yes, there is a sense of uh, hierarchy. There is a sense of uh, power, uh, you know, control. But uh, Conrad presents it in a very different way, obviously. And uh, remember that when Shakespeare wrote The Tempest, certainly he didn't have these in mind. We are reading the post-colonial things into it. Conrad was well aware of the imperialist designs, and he was writing with the consciousness of it. Right? And yes, I have found that quotation which uh, one of our students wanted. Conrad had noted that. It's a beautiful quotation. Our best hopes, our best hopes, our best hopes are irrealizable. It is the almost incredible misfortune of mankind 
but also its highest privilege to aspire towards the impossible. Right? Yes, next question. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, actually, I have a question of my own. Yes. And, uh, first, I should thank you for that very insightful session. Uh, thank you so, so much, much. ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I, I ask this as uh, from a perspective of someone who is like uh, beginning his uh, teaching career in literature in higher academics. Ma'am, uh, suppose we are teaching a text, we are reading a text uh, rather uh, in a class, something like Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, in contrast, we are reading Shinu Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Mm -hmm. Now, one is uh, a text about Africa and mm -hmm. another is proper African narrative. Very so interesting how, question. How do, we, how do we differentiate our approach, our interrogation in terms of the two when we are reading, rereading the two texts in class? Because uh, is there a question of authenticity that comes in? And uh, is there a gap like in Conrad's narrative? Because uh, whatever he is, he's still writing as an outsider. Now, that is my question. Like, so, I love this question. I have so much to say. <laughs> because uh, Things Fall Apart is one of my favorite novels. And Heart of Darkness too is, you know, because just like I love Austin. I, I love Austin in every way, but I love Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte too, and the two are so very different from each other, right? The Bronte sisters, and also, so you can love this and that. So I'm following the Conradian paradox, the homo do play element. Now, let me talk about Conrad first, like Heart of Darkness, when he wrote Heart of Darkness. The first thing is, let us contextualize Conrad. It is it was written in late in the late Victorian age and published in early in 1902. So first part of the 20th century. The imperialist impulses were very much all around him. Conrad was well aware of what was happening. But at the same time, and he was a traveler. Remember that among the other writers who were in station writers, writing within the insular topography of England, Conrad had traveled across the world, particularly Southeast Asia, and also he had gone to Africa. And remember that he was an outsider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. He had this, uh, he was not speaking out of the way on the basis of things which he has read, not secondary information, but primary information. And another thing is, he was an outsider, I fully agree with you, but he was a Polish national. There's a lot of difference between West uh, European culture and East European culture. Right. He was oppressed. He saw the oppression by white men. He was a white man, a Polish nationalist, and his parents, who were Polish nationals, were oppressed by white men. So what kind of colonization would you call this? This is also a form of colonization, white man's exploitation of other white men, minority white men. I think right? some kind of solidarity grows yeah. from out of that empathy. Yeah. And sorry. Right. Now, he knew what exploitation means, and that is probably a reason why he has a paradoxical attitude in Heart of Darkness. He's an outsider. He's a white man. He makes his uh, narrator go to the heart of Africa, look at these people, and they are very strange. And there is a twitching of the eyebrows, and there is a questioning, there is interrogation, there is, uh, how are they? Whatever is strange to us is kirokum jano. It's you know very strange, isn't it? But we don't want to go into the heart of things and see that there is a beauty in that Kirokum Janu also. So uh, here, what we find is he's an outsider, no doubt, but he has his sympathies also. Though, of course, Achebe calls him a bloody racist because of reasons that he quotes sections from the novel where Conrad is portraying these people as raw materials, uh, as as uh, as phantoms, as uh, stocky figures, as dark people, etc. But that is true because that is that also has got to be accepted because he has gone there for the first time and that is his honest view of the place. But at the same time, he sympathizes like George Orwell does in shooting an elephant. Do you remember that essay? Yes, in that yes, essay, he's sympathizing also with those natives. And he's saying that sometimes I feel like giving them a bash, but at, at other times I sympathize wholeheartedly with them. So here also, he is sympathizing with them. So his attitude is very paradoxical. We cannot say that this is black and this is white. And that is why he is a modernist. It's full of contradictions. Nothing is. On the other hand, in, in uh, Things Fall Apart, it's a classic in black literature, in African literature. It's an epic, actually. I consider it to be epic. Uh, in that particular novel, 
what we find is Achebe is portraying the vices of colonization where the white man comes and colonizes them through the tragic experiences of a character called Okonko, right? And also his conflicts with his father and his community and how he, you know, how he commits suicide, etc., etc. Now, it is therefore a conflict between the white civilization's entry into the into Africa and the way in which a black man who is a chief looks at it. He is the highest in the uh, social hierarchy of his own society and he looks at it. So it is a looking back. That is, the insider is looking at the outsider's methods of colonization, assessing it, analyzing it, criticizing it. And the white man, by the way, just as the uh, black men are being looked up down upon by the white men, the white men are described as lepers. In Chinuachibis novels, with skins, they are, they are so white in color that the skin looks leprous, which is a cursing way of describing them. So this is like, you know, what reminds you of Will Ashcroft's The Empire Rides Back. Right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. All right, then, I think uh, we have already <laughs> given enough questions, enough time for the interactive session. So whatever questions are left, uh, if you want them to get answered, kindly mail them to us. We will surely pass it on to ma'am and she will sure. fly back. All right, sure. because uh, we do not have enough time to take all the questions. So now I would request Oindraladi to say what Thank you. Saying. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your enlightening responses. I hope uh, the participants are benefited and satisfied with the responses and observations. Uh, now I request Professor Swara Thakkar to deliver the vote of time. Thank you, Oindraladi. Um, respected guests and dear participants, on behalf of the organizing committee, I, Professor Swara Thakkar, faculty member of the Department of English at PHK Jain College, extend a hearty vote of thanks to our speaker for today's session, Professor Dr. Chandrani Biswas. Thank you, ma'am, for taking out time from your busy schedule for addressing the audience. I have been fortunate to have you as my teacher, and I wanted to share this experience with others as well. By accepting our invitation to speak on Conrad's Heart of Darkness, you have given all of us the opportunity to understand the multiple facets of this complex text. I'm sure your valuable insights and analysis will equip the audience to explore and enjoy Conrad's works. I would also like to express my gratitude to the college authorities and our principal ma'am, Dr. Moshumi Singh Sen Gupta, for providing us the opportunity and support for organizing this lecture series. Lastly, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined in from different parts of the country for their patience and cooperation. We hope that today's session has contributed to the enhancement of their knowledge. We have many more interesting sessions lined up for them in the upcoming days. We expect the same enthusiastic participation from their side for those sessions as well. So with this, we come to the end of our session today. Once again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Bisha. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, our principal ma'am and uh, to the head of the department ma'am and uh, the organizers among which we have our students and also uh, you, uh, many of the organizers and the one who contacted the questions, the young professor. Thank you so much. You have handled uh, the session very well. And it, it has yeah. been a delightful experience for me. So uh, it is a positive side of uh, lockdown means we are yes, getting opportunity yes. to hear from you because otherwise it would have not been possible for yeah. us to reach out. Means you are so busy with your regular task and everything. We so all are, really, but it is your endeavor. I congratulate you. We expect a very good session um, ahead because we have three more lectures. Yes. And I'm really thankful to Swara, Deepan, and Venzuela. Yes. Uh, they are so nice, means they have managed it so beautifully. So excellent. 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 Every technical background yes. was given by the department itself. Yes. It means yes. all the starting from designing mm -hmm. poster and everything, managing yeah, the poster, 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 everything. Poster. Really a great job done. Yes, okay, absolutely. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you, you ma'am.
Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, Thank you all the participants. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we leave, I would just like to announce that the next session is on 12th of August 2020 from 5 p.m. So I would request all the participants to join 10 minutes before the session starts, just like you did today. And in case you have faced any technical problems today, any technical issues, we apologize for that. It is our first attempt at organizing such a program. So please kindly forgive us. And we will try our best that all your issues get solved before the next session starts. So thank you. And thank you. And, uh, Thank you, uh, thank, thank you so much, ma'am. And one more thing I would like to uh, say to the participants that uh, please attend all the sessions and the feedback link will be provided on the last day of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Bye, ma'am. Bye. Swada, you can stop the recording now, I think.